And, and some of you may be asking, what the heck is the Secretary of Correction from Pennsylvania talking to us about when a juvenile system isn't even under him? And one of the other things that's kind of missing from the conversation, or, or actually is now becoming part of the conversation, is those 51,000 individuals I have in my system today, they have at least 81,000 children. 81,000 children of just the people incarcerated in state prisons in Pennsylvania. That doesn't include the 40,000 that are incarcerated in county jails in Pennsylvania and their children. And many of these children you touch on a daily basis. Every year as part of my job, and the best part of my job, is I tour all 26 prisons. And my tours are all unannounced, which my staff loves. <laughs> I started this about two years ago, and I was driving through a town, and I got thirsty. It happened to be a town we have a prison in. So I stopped to get a drink. An officer saw me. They cleaned the whole prison. I was just driving through. <laughs> That's how I roll. <laughs> But um, there's one prison tour a year I hate. And what you may not know about Pennsylvania is that Pennsylvania leads the country in juvenile lifers. So we're sixth in prison population in the country. And sixth by a long shot. I mean, uh, Texas, Florida, California, all about uh, three times our population. We have 500 juvenile lifers in Pennsylvania. And we have our juveniles in a prison um, called Pine Grove. And I dread that visit every year. And every year that visit is the same thing. Now when I come and do these unannounced tours, I spend about 20 or 30 minutes talking to the superintendent, giving him a chance to clean up some, old, some new dirt. You can't clean up the old dirt in a half hour. The new dirt you can clean up a little bit. So I give him a little, little time to scramble. And then we walk through, and I walk through every uh, housing unit. I walk through the segregation unit. I, my executive deputy and I literally go to every seg cell in our system every year. Then I stand outside the chow hall, and I talk to everybody who comes, all the inmates who want. So I literally talk to hundreds of inmates on my tours. But it's these juveniles. It's these kids who, if you get a juvenile in the adult system in Pennsylvania, they're generally serving a fairly long period of time. 10, 15, 20, heck, 500 of them life, right? And you see these baby faces. And many of them, black baby faces. And I talk to these kids and the consistent theme. I, I, I can quote it to you because I hear it every time. I go, why are you here? Help me understand. Help me understand how you're doing the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life in a state prison. And I hear this response time after time. Secretary, I'm gonna be dead by 25. So what does it matter? Now, can you imagine can you imagine not thinking you're gonna live longer than another five or 10 years? I don't know about you, but if I was gonna die in a year, God forbid, I wouldn't have a savings account. <laughs> don't tell my kids. <laughs> These kids have no hope. That light at the end of the tunnel, they think it's gonna run them over. And think about a life without hope. And think about a young man, the life without hope. We looked system-wide. We, uh, we pulled all the data from education, and we looked at incarceration rate by school district. And we looked at what the, the, the factors, we looked at reading levels, amount spent per student, uh, PSSA scores. We looked at every fact you could possibly look at. 
there were two predictive factors that would predict a higher incarceration rate. Number one, or number two, the second most impactful um, factor was schools with more black kids, specifically young black men. But the most predictive factor, single parent homes. So in spite of the fact that Martin Luther King gave a sermon 50 years ago called Tough Mind, Tender Heart, I think it really makes sense in the context of what you do, in the context of who you work with. Because I'll tell you what those kids lack. Number one, those kids lack hope. Number two, those kids lack connectedness. The vast majority of the kids I talk to who are involved in violence are in gangs. They're in gangs because they want to be connected. They're in gangs because they want someone to care about them. And it may not make sense for us, but if you can't find that anywhere else, you're gonna find it somewhere else. And the other consistent factor is they lack toughness. And you may think I'm crazy, because we're talking about people who are coming in for violent offenses, and we equate toughness with anger, and we equate toughness with fighting and football in some cities. <laughs> but the toughness that I believe Dr. King was talking about is not that anger toughness. It's the kind of toughness that that kid needs to grow up in the horrible environment some of these kids are growing up in. We live in a country where your zip code and your parent and sometimes the color of your skin dictates your future outcome. And we gotta change that. And we have an opportunity to change that. And when he uses the analogy of the toughness of a serpent, at first, to me, it sounded kind of strange. Not that I would question Dr. King, but it sounded kind of strange. But when you think of the process that a serpent goes through every year, when they shed their skin, and think of it in the context of the kids you touch, it's a fresh start every year. Whatever damage that skin has taken, as painful as that skin is, Every year they have a new opportunity. And when you touch them, they have a new opportunity. And when we do it right, they never end up with me. These kids need help. They need help. And, and again, we don't, we're not comfortable with toughness, so call it resilient. These kids need to be resilient to get through the environment. I talked to a kid, I spoke at an event in Philadelphia, and I talked to a kid who you literally has to travel about a mile and a quarter through bad neighborhoods to get to school. I don't know about you, but if I'm literally ducking and dodging through neighborhoods I'm scared of, I'm not sure I'm gonna be sitting down first period and be able to concentrate on algebra. but we're likely not gonna be able to change that situation, but we can change this situation. Because what we know is that life is not about what happens to us, it's about how we respond. But then when you add the factor that we lack guidance, especially for the young men, we don't have anybody who's guiding them to how to respond to these situations. So our goal really should be to build tough minds resilient kids.